I want to go back briefly to your moment with watching Antonio in The Merchant of Venice, maybe Leo Cicciri, and that moment that obviously planted something in you. Because uh, many of us have, have those kind of rooting moments mm -hmm. that says something about what we would do. But my question is that you were such a reader mm -hmm. and you lived mm -hmm. deeply in the world of imagination and what you got and that form of communication. Mm -hmm. And you have the whole intellectual side that you can study English mm -hmm. literature. What was different about that moment in the theater with what Leo Cicciri or whoever it was, Antonio, that surpassed what you see in books? Well, it was, first of all, it was life-size. It was right in the same room with me. And there were no words at that point. He was standing alone. It was the culmination of the, the whole afternoon. And he was left standing by himself. And it, he was kind of a Christ-like figure, as I recall. He had a long, dark beard. And, and uh, it was, everybody else was going off for their marriages. And he was left on his own. And years later, when I was in the play, as Jessica and then as Portia, I remember that solitude of Jessica and Antonio, that they were both estranged in a way, or had lost something in this comedy. Jessica had lost her father, well, lost her way of life, lost her, her world in the Jewish community. And Antonio had lost Bassanio. He was now with his wife. And all that hit you in that silence? Yes, because I think the great thing about Shakespeare is there are so many resonances. If you try and reduce Shakespeare, you, you block off so many other associations. And it just hits you and you go, oh, it's that moment of, oh. I hear it in John Gabriel Borgman. And Lucy and I reach out to each other at the very end because we have been like this for the whole evening. And then when there's this, oh, it's that moment of, oh, what's going to happen now? Even though the lights are going down, it's, what's going to happen now? Many of the, uh, not to dwell on it, but many of the iconic moments that rooted uh, theater artists were not spoken words in theater. Mm -hmm. They were silences in mm -hmm. theaters. How it does sounds, the silence work? Well, because, because it's, <laughs> it won't work if you have, lo I don't think, if you have lots and lots of silences throughout the, they're there because something else is, is happening. You've had to earn the silence really, unless you're doing mime <laughs> or meme. You know, you have to earn that moment of silence where the only thing that speaks loudest is silence. But you see, I am actually orally stimulated. Words do it for me. It's usually not the visuals. It's the word that goes to me, usually. You know, or a sound. The, the actors sound what, what they're expressing you know, I still remember Martha Henry, was it Happy Days? No, Happy Days Beckett? She made a sound at one point that I went, uh, connected to me. So we l work in a medium of which there are words, sounds, emotions, and there is the space between the words or the silences. Mm -hmm. In Toronto Workshop Productions, I saw Flowers with Lindsay Kemp. Mm -hmm. He did a cross across the back of the stage silent for a minute. It was riveting mm -hmm. and I adore words. But what in the silence is so powerful? Well also you have time to project whatever you want on that silence. You, you know, you, you can fill it with whatever you're receiving. So let Robert do a quick editorial here. The bugbear, whether the audience is a consumer or a participant in the experience. When you are a consumer, you do not enter the silence because you passively consume what is given to you from the stage. <coughs> if you are a true participant in the theater, in the audience, mm -hmm. that silence, as you say, you come out of yourself and participate and create in the silence. Oh yes, I mean, you know, when you talk to, you know, when you do talkbacks and things to, with audiences and y y they're kind of surprised that you can hear them and see them and are aware of every, you're aware of that. You, you, hear, you hear sitting on the edge of your seat. 
You hear people not breathing. You're very aware of it. And that room is what is exciting. That exchange is what is exciting. Because as the audience goes out the door going, oh, that was a great show, or oh, that was boring, we're going out the other door going, that was a great audience. Boy, they were great. Oh, boy, they were dull. But they liked all the shtick bits. They liked this. Oh, they really responded to the irony today. They, you know? So it's, it's very interesting because it is an exchange. And you know, you, you, you are very aware of what's going on, like the woman ruffling through her bag for 20 minutes, or, or uh, you know, the slow unwrapping of the candy wrapper, when you just say, please just do it fast. Like, you know, just do it fast, get it over with, you know? Or the, lo the leaf blower in the background. Or the leaf the blower in the background, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's part of the room. <coughs> it's it's a candy wrapper being slowly unwrapped. Slowly unwrapped, and you go, please <coughs> finish your leaf blowing now. But, um, and I've grown much more tolerant of all those kinds of strange things, you know, wrappers and things. Before, I was much more, I remember doing Medea, and people talked to me about the moment when the phone rang, and I stopped and just stared at them for as long, and I waited. And it was in a very particularly <laughs> dark moment of Medea. And uh, um, they, people say, <coughs> I didn't want to be that person. Is there an argument or an observation to be made that the space between the words or the silence, which is that other part of what we do on stage, has a correlation into the space in paintings? If a painting is full of um, items and literalness, the tree, the whatever, the painting, the boat, the canoe, the binocular, or the space within which the painter puts Colville puts the mm -hmm. binoculars, the woman, the sailboat, mm -hmm. but the space, is that correlated to what we try to work with the bodies in a, in a theater, do you think? I think it is, except that in our silences on stage, your thoughts are still active. You're still thinking something. You're still trying to perhaps articulate something. Or it's active, it's just not through here. It's not a blank canvas. Or it shouldn't be. Or it shouldn't be. You know, you sometimes see that. An actor speak, silence, and then nothing is going on there. And you go, well, then I'm not compelled to witness that, or I'm not understanding why you need time to be quiet why you have nothing to say. In Shakespeare, it's always fascinating watching the person who doesn't say anything because they're the witness to what's going on. And the audience sometimes looks to the witness to say, am I perceiving this correctly? Or are you seeing something that I'm not seeing? Like the Greek chorus, right? They watch the two-hander and they say to the audience, did you see that? What do you think about that? They're, they're the wavering participants, but it's, they're the conduit between the audience and the, the protagonist antagonist. Because these people are not going to change each other's minds. They have very strong positions. It's up to these people to convince those people to make their argument. And the chorus is going, I thought that was good. What did you think? I, I, I'm on her side. Are you? you know?